cool. Yeah. All right. Hi, everyone. I believe we are live now, finally. Uh, sorry for the delay that we had. Um, it was just that uh, Yasmin had technical issues on her side. So uh, I had to wait too. This, is, this has nothing to do with my German background. I'm still very German. I'm still on time here. So sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Yasmin. How are you doing? I'm good. It's my Arab background. That's why I couldn't be on time. So <laughs> it works. <laughs> so sorry again, guys. But now we are here. We can start talking. Uh, I'm here with Yasmin Mohammed, an ex-Muslim and an activist for all those who don't uh, know very well. I believe people who know me know you already. Um, Yasmin, why don't you just go ahead and uh, tell us a bit about yourself, about your background and so on. Just Okay, so for those of you who uh, don't know me, my name is Yasmin Mohammed, like Rico said. Um, I grew up in Canada from a Egyptian and Arab background. So um, even though I grew up in Canada with an Arab background and you grew up in Germany with a Turkish background, we have lots of similarities in our, in our stories growing up. Mm -hmm. um, I think that they're, the similarities that we have are things that are gonna be familiar to many Muslims all across the planet and ex-Muslims as well. So I grew up in a very fundamentalist sort of conservative, very religious household. I went to Islamic schools. I was married off very young um, in a forced marriage. And it turns out that the man that I was married to was a member of Al Qaeda. Mm -hmm. And we had a child together. And I was eventually able to get my daughter and myself away from him and mm -hmm. go to university. And that's when I took a history of religions course and I started to look at Islam objectively, like academically, not, not as a believer where I'm not allowed to question anything because mm -hmm. questioning is the shaitan in your yeah. ear, waswasa. So um, I questioned and I talked about it and I thought about it and I realized, wow, this is such bullshit. <laughs> this, is, this is really bad. Like it's not just childish ridiculous fairy tales with very dangerous misogynistic hateful violent stuff yeah, yeah, yeah. and so uh, i left islam very quietly and i never talked about it i just thought i was the only person on the planet that was ever decided to not be muslim anymore it was a long process, right? So for a long time, I was like, oh, I'm Muslim, but I'm just not practicing. And then it was like, oh, I don't believe in formal religions, but I believe in spirituality and blah, blah, blah. And until I was finally, it took me many years till I finally just said, okay, I'm just agnostic atheist. Uh -huh. And uh, now it's kind of funny that it took me that long because it's just, the whole thing is just ridiculous to me now. But um yeah, and then I was very quiet for many years, got remarried, had a new baby, moving on with my life. Hardly anybody knew about my past life. And then uh, the famous Ben Affleck episode on Bill Maher with Sam Harris, uh -huh. where Ben Affleck simply was not listening to what Sam Harris and Bill Maher were saying. And I realized that Ben was approaching Islam in the same way that I used to approach Islam, which was that it was different than all the other religions and that it was above criticism in a way that the other religions are not. And I used to feel that way. And, and I realized that, oh my gosh, he th thinks that as well as so many other Western people, they think that it's okay to make fun of Christianity. It's okay to, to criticize aspects of all the religions or ideologies but you can't talk about Islam because then that's just not, that's just not acceptable. It's gross. It's racist. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I that's what made me start to speak up. I decided I wanted to be gross and racist. Initially <laughs> it was uh, anonymously. I started Confessions of an Ex-Muslim, uh, the blog where I was writing my, my life story anonymously in the beginning. But then I started to get contacted by so many people from across the Muslim world that were just, in positions where they could not talk and they were very grateful that I was talking. Mm -hmm. 
And then I started to feel ashamed of myself because here I am living in a free country and how could I not show my face and be public about my criticisms when there are millions and millions of people who want to do what I'm doing, but will be killed for it, literally. Absolutely. So yeah, I felt like it was my responsibility and as as scary as it is and as, you know, all of the issues that come with that, I don't have to tell you, mm -hmm. you know, you feel compelled to continue to do this work. The more they try to shut you down, the more, the more motivated you become to continue. Yeah. Another thing that I thought is uh, when people ask me why I uh, put my face out there and my voice and my name and do this very openly when it could be actually very dangerous. I don't know. I just, I just think, you know, we are not the ones who are criminals. We are not the ones who are who are guilty in this. You know, we are doing something that we are that we should be allowed to do. That we should be doing. We should be speaking out and sharing our our ideas and our criticism and our experience. Those people who could pose a danger to us, they are the criminals. They are the bad ones. It's not us who should be hiding. We should be out here speaking with our faces. They should be hiding. That's you know, beautifully not the said. Other way around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, when did it happen? Um, that phase when you started to, uh, to to sort of question and to criticize it. Uh, around around what age did it happen for you? Uh, I was in my twenties, so it's probably the about twenty five, twenty six. So, mm -hmm. um, I have I feel, I'll have a lot of resentment for all of the years that were wasted under Islam and all of the years, all of the things that I missed out on. So another reason why I want to speak out now is hopefully for the people that are questioning and, and feeling alone right now, I want them to feel encouraged to get out as soon as possible before they waste more of their life. Oh, well, I'm, I know I'm just, I'm just reading some funny thing that people say. Um, um, I, I'm curious, how did that thing happen? Um, you said you got in the, in that, into that relationship, which is which is really beyond imagination. It's it's beyond limits. I mean, uh, you said he was an Al Qaeda member. How did that? Yeah. How did that? So come that? this was pre nine eleven. So I didn't know who Al Qaeda were. I didn't know um, who Bin Laden was. But I knew. So when he entered Canada, he came with a. Saudi Arabian passport and he came mm -hmm. from Afghanistan as a fake Saudi Arabian passport. He's actually Egyptian. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So he, uh, he, he came, it turns out I was reading a New York times article later that said that he was the key. He was the, the main direct contact with bin laden for the whole cell that was in canada so he was the leader of the canadian cell it's insane yeah so he um he is in prison now last i heard he's in prison Great. he was involved in a really huge so in egypt one of our presidents was uh assassinated anwar sadat and mm -hmm. that was the large ter the largest terrorist you know, court case in, in Egyptian history. And this court case that Assam was part of was the second largest in, in Egyptian history. So it was pretty high profile. So with Egypt, what they usually do when somebody is um, suspected of terrorism or not suspect, well, when they know that somebody is a terrorist, I don't think that they do it with suspected people, but when they're sure somebody is a terrorist, they just kill them, they just get rid of them. Mm -hmm. But because this was a very high profile international case, because it was the FBI that actually um, sent him back to Egypt, mm -hmm. the Egyptian authorities couldn't just kill him. So he was part of this whole court case and he was sentenced to 15 years hard labor, but that was almost 20 years ago. So um, I don't know if he has survived, but even if he has not, they wouldn't, I don't expect them to ever let him out of prison. Yeah, 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 totally understandable. It, it, it's weird. I mean, you were directly uh, involved with something, as said before, totally beyond the limit. I mean, you have seen, you, you have seen sort of the worst uh, face of it. I mean, how can people tell you that you shouldn't come out and, and, and talk about these things now? Well, I think it's the people that that have the most to lose from me talking about it are the ones that want me to stop talking. It's uh -huh. easy to say, it's easy to talk about things when it doesn't have a face 
or a name or a real story behind it, an actual personality. It's, it's easy, easy to dismiss things and say, oh, this kind of terrorism just happens over there yeah. with those weird people. And they like it. They like to wear niqab and they like to, to be living in, in, these, uh, in these countries. So it's much more difficult to dismiss when no, nope, it happened right here in your own yeah. backyard, and I am a Canadian, and <laughs> I'm one of you. And I know I didn't like wearing the club. Yeah. What was that? Yeah, like it's it's just it's human, mm -hmm. and I think that all of us are are connected, obviously, on that human level, and it's really hard for them to to just dismiss me and ignore me and to pretend that this is a much smaller situation than it really is because that's what they like to say they like to yeah. say oh this is just a very small minority regardless of the fact that it's happening all over the world almost every single day they're still mm -hmm. going to talk about how it's just such a tiny minority so i'm here you know very loudly saying nah -uh. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but by the way i want to tell you that um Lots of people in the comment section are praising you right now and telling Aww. you that they, they love you, that you are so brave. And um, you brought me the biggest uh, watching people count ever so far. So, <laughs> Oh, good. <laughs> <I'm happy. laughs> more. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much for watching. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you guys. I really appreciate the support. I bring it on. Please send all the love my way because <laughs> I get all the hate all the time. And you know how we are. We harp yeah. on the hate. And yeah, yeah. so it's it's nice to be overpowered by love. You can send the hate to me. I just laugh about no. it. <laughs> <laughs> You're, so many guys say that. It's a weird thing. Like I know I don't love it. I'm not into I don't I don't like confrontation, weirdly enough, for me doing this. I don't like confrontation. I don't like any of this negativity that comes with this work. But the I feel like I that's just part and parcel. Like I mm -hmm. have to I have mm -hmm. to deal with it if I want to do any good or or have anything positive come out of this? I have to just deal with the with the garbage. Yeah, I'm being sarcastic. I mean, um, my thing is just that before I started this this whole uh, YouTube project, I spent a year on Instagram, uh, just just uh, with with a satirical account, which was also called the Prophet, and afterwards the uh, the Apostate Prophet. And I got really toughened up there by all those peaceful people who follow a very peaceful religion. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I received like I received dozens of uh, death threats and insults and stuff like that every day and right now i can only laugh about it because if i just really dive into it and read those things it's it's so depressing it's <laughs> yeah it's true i do feel sorry for a lot of these people especially since the way they talk is 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 like cyborgs they're all saying the exact same yeah, thing yeah, yeah. it's the same brainwashing that you had and the same brainwashing that i had and we probably would have been saying the, the exact same words and so when i see the same words being repeated over and over and over again my heart is like, oh, you people like you just never had a chance to use your brain like it was it was taken from you from yeah, such yeah. a young age mm -hmm. before you had an opportunity to foster any kind of critical thinking skills whatsoever. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. yeah, I do feel and most of the comments that we get, like the death threats and stuff are basically psychotic people. They're like, fuck you, whore, dick face, motherfucker. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's not. These your are not mother, rational. Your sister, and this and that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they always have to go with like the worst stuff. And then you have the other side of the spectrum as well. I also have a lot of people on the far left that have to go into like, oh, you Nazi loving, white supremacist, you know, same thing. Again, they just repeat the same like sound bites like no, I, had, I had even, I had even uh, people from that from that side of the spectrum even not, from from the far left as you say uh, telling me that that Muslims sending me such insults and threats uh, do that rightfully because I'm insulting uh, them and their religion which is why they can normally do such things to me mashallah from they so are such good <laughs> why don't these people just move to Saudi Arabia or Afghanistan 
or Pakistan where the blasphemy laws are yeah, yeah. so strong and that's the kind of countries that they yeah, would spend a, spend a year there or spend two years there or just a few months and then come back mm -hmm. and say the same things again yeah there you yeah. Yeah. <laughs> speaking of brainwashing i wanted to ask you um how much were you uh involved in that's that's a weird question Let the me... terrorist activities <laughs> yeah i mean how much were you like sucked into that so the new term which didn't exist when i was growing up now is people start to talk about islamists mm -hmm, and they talk mm -hmm. about islamism as if it's a separate religion but um I don't like to use the word Islamism because I feel like it's all Islam, mm -hmm. but I will use the term Islamist now, which refers to a Muslim who is interested in seeing Allah's word ruling all of the planet. Yeah. So they try to, to, to spread Islam through the sword or through government or through immigration or through having babies or through whatever they want to spread Islam. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's where my family belonged. That's where I was. So we were, we were always being taught that uh, the caliphate will rise and it is our responsibility to join it when it does. Mm -hmm. And this is not, uh, you know, my family were not unique because this is why when ISIS became powerful, you saw people from Belgium, from the UK, from Australia, from Canada, from America, from all over the world, all of a sudden they all just convened like moths to a flame. And everybody's wondering, how did these people get radicalized so quickly? It must be the internet. <laughs> and they didn't realize like, no, these people were from birth. They were told this will happen one day. And when it does, you have to join the fight. Mm -hmm. And I was one of those people and I really did you know, I think it's sort of like when Christians get told Messiah is going to come back. Like, yeah, you believe it, but you don't really think it's going to happen in your lifetime. But uh, I did believe it, but I didn't think it was going to happen in my lifetime. And I'm glad that it didn't happen when I was still a practicing Muslim because I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Well, the thing is, uh, as you said, I mean, people try to blame it on on this and that, on on politics, on the far right, and whatever you know, all the nonsense. Unemployment. <laughs> yeah, unemployment, absolutely. Poverty and complete nonsense. But I mean, it, it's it's so easy to see. But people, uh, the, the the problem is when people see it, uh, they just simply deny the existence of it from the very beginning, which is why they can't acknowledge that those people turn to that because of their own ideology. Like I give example from from myself. Uh, I, I was born in Germany into a, a Turkish family. And, you know, Turks are usually not that not that religious, not that fundamentalist people. Uh, most of them ad adhere to a, a rather Sufi uh, way of, of, of thinking about Islam. And my parents were also, my parents are also Sufis. They are still practicing Sufis. And, um, and m most people around us were, for example, uh, Turks, since they, they were also kind of from the same culture. They were not Islamists. But uh, if you go into the family and if, if families gather and talk about all the people outside, about, about Christians and the Jews and atheists, it all just comes out. The thing is... Um, they don't they don't reflect it the same way uh, when they are outside and talking to to german people or to canadian people for example but inside the house the yeah. conversations that go on there are are ones that you would call radical on social media nowadays yeah that they have an inside voice and an outside voice oh yeah, for absolutely. sure absolutely yeah. I, in, in my family which was a rather mysticist and peaceful family as well as in other similar families there was always this extreme um verbal verbally expressed hatred towards mainly jews mm -hmm. then uh Christians because we used to live among them and then all the other ones you know they would they would they, they wouldn't even mention atheists by name for example they wouldn't even respect the existence of atheists atheists were just uh wicked lost creatures who belong all to hell and and that that's that was the mainstream talk of the Muslim community wherever I went in my life and people don't people refuse to see that yeah totally 100 <laughs> percent, completely agree with you and the the problem is when you give somebody like an Islamist that like these people that I was mentioning, you give them a microphone mm -hmm. and what do they say? 
oh, we love America. We eat, we're Muslims and we fight, you know, the same fight you fight and we're patriotic and we love the flag. And, you know, and then they say all their bullshit and you and I know that it's bullshit and they know mm -hmm. that they're spouting bullshit, mm -hmm. but people want to hear that and they want to believe that. And then when you and I come out and we say the opposite is true, don't believe these people, they're not telling you the truth. They don't want to hear what we have to say because what we have to say makes them uncomfortable, makes it difficult for them to continue on with their lives, living with their with their heads in the sand. If Linda Sarsour tells them something, oh no, you know we're all patriots, then it's easy for them to say, oh okay, no problem, you know let's let's get on with our lives. Mm -hmm. But when you and I come along and say no, that's not actually the case then it makes it, then they have to do something about it and they don't want to have to do anything about it. Well, I think Lena Sarsour is the, is the, I don't know, the worst of that kind, I would say. Yeah. Because if, if you if you come from a Muslim background and if you are against it, if you uh, broke free from that, then it's, it's just so damn obvious what so she's obvious. doing and what she's actually thinking when she makes tweets like, oh, can't we all just get along? Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they eat it up with a spoon they just yeah. love it they just yeah. love her rhetoric and yeah. she knows it though and this was the thing with Hassan al Benna who went when the Muslim Brotherhood started another thing Tariq Ramadan is over in Europe so he's he's the Linda Sorsour of Europe when they when the Muslim Brotherhood started they they said we want to have our children in the West so that they can understand the Western mentality so that they can fight it from within. Mm -hmm. Because we are at a disadvantage because we're not born and raised in the West so we don't know how to talk to these people so that we can convince them of what we want to convince them. But our children will be able to do that and our grandchildren will be able to do that. And everything that they had hoped for, unfortunately, is coming to fruition. It's it's still going on. I mean, that same strategy from from such organizations, especially the Muslim Brotherhood, is still going on. I mean, there are still so many people in the world, especially in the West, who don't really know. Although the history is very rich about that, who don't really know how to define the Muslim Brotherhood. You know how to how to really have an opinion about it. What opinion to have about it? So it it, it sort of works what they are trying to do, but. Yeah, and I think it's because people are confused because they see Muslim Brotherhood and so they assume that they are just average, normal, everyday, law-abiding Muslim citizens. Mm -hmm. And so then they think if I speak out against it, that makes me a racist or that yeah. makes me xenophobic or it makes me a bigot or whatever. But what they're not understanding is they're <laughs> not all Muslims are anything. All yeah. Muslims, whatever you say at the end of that sentence is going to be incorrect. Absolutely. Just like if you say all men, all women, all Christians, all anything, you can't, you can't generalize like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's important when they start to act as if all Muslims are one thing, unfortunately, that one thing is always going to be terrorists or Arabs or, you know, something, like I said, it's always going to be wrong. Mm -hmm. But when they do that, they're not allowing for the fact, the, 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 the basic fact, that Muslims are a varied people just like any other group on the planet. And most Muslims, yes, just like most human beings, I mean, we're living in, all of us are living in, in comfortable societies, not full of serial killers, because most human beings are good people. Most mm -hmm. human beings aren't murderers. Most human beings don't have terrorist tendencies, but some of us do, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, Absolutely. and, and, and some of us have, um, bad intentions and it's important to differentiate between the average Muslims and the Muslims that do have negative intentions and Muslim brotherhood are a perfect example of that. Mm -hmm. And, all, and Hezb Tahrir and, you know, I could go on and on. There's Islamist organizations as well as jihadi organizations, just because they don't have a sword and they're not taking sex slaves doesn't mean that they don't have the exact same mindset, the exact same goals, but they're just doing it in a different way. Islamists I, I will do even... it through government and jihadis will do it through violence yeah i would even expand that to, uh, to to organizations that exist in the west as well i mean I, I wouldn't say all of them but um there are specific organizations and specific movements and people like uh, care well kind of 
I wouldn't, mm. I wouldn't equate that to the Muslim Brotherhood, but I would say there are definitely hints and definitely very, very dubious and very obvious also things that they have done in their past, uh, ties that they still haven't maintained, that they don't want to renounce. Uh, that's just one example. There are so many others, you know. Mm -hmm. and what, what what came to my mind about uh, what we just said about this, you know, um, Islam sort of creates this uh, untouchable image in the world, and people can can sort of do whatever they want. That, that reminds me of this uh, of the Linda Sarsour case and the and the women's march. Uh, I made a video about that just w when it was happening. But you remember there was this case with the with the Nation of Islam when. Um, well, Lena Sarsour and Tomika Mallory, for example, uh, went to, to one of their meetings and uh, spoke with them together. They were hand in hand. They called um, Louis Farrakhan. Farrakhan. Yeah, Louis Farrakhan, our brother, our good brother and stuff like that. And, and people just couldn't denounce that, you know? Mm -hmm. People just couldn't come together and say, uh, sorry, why, why, why are you working with, with Islamic supremacists? Why are you working with racists? Why are you doing this? They couldn't come together and do this. The I mean, they're the liberal left. Yeah. And this man is an unapologetic, anti-Semitic, homophobic bigot, and they can't speak up against him. It's openly anti-white, openly anti-Semitic, uh, anti openly homophobic. He has said many uh, things about women before and so much yes. more. And, and the Women's March, which is supposed to be liberal, liberating, yep. uh, comes and walks with those people hand in hand and doesn't even make an explanation about it. It's just... <laughs> Yeah, it was very, That's very confusing. But the good thing about stuff like that happening, I mean, not the good thing, but a result, one positive result of that kind of thing happening is that people, sane, rational human beings are seeing that and mm -hmm. it's making them speak up, right? There was Jake Tapper from CNN that spoke up against that and, and Linda Sarsour called him alt-right or alt -right, something, yeah. which is like... You call Jake Tapper alt-right. Yeah, <laughs> so it, it makes people say like, what? What is happening? These people are crazy. Uh -huh. And that's what we want. We want people to see them for the crazy that they are because what's frustrating is that people think that they are, you know, perfectly rational human beings and that they think that they're their friends and that they're working together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's change the topic a bit. What, what do you think about, um, I talked about this so often during my live chat. I talked with Armin Navabi before about this, but um, he has very clear opinions about it. I bet, you know, uh, I'm talking about reforming Islam, the yes. future of Islam. What would you what, what would you say about it? Do you think it's ever possible? Do you think, uh, or, or what do you think is the best way to change Islam into a rather acceptable uh, form or anything? So I, I understand where Armin is coming from. He's totally against reform and he's not the only one. Lots and lots of ex-Muslims are, and they think that it's just a, um, you know, a cuddly version of a very dangerous ideology. And so it's going to eventually grow strong enough to become the basics of what it's supposed to be. You know, mm -hmm. if, if you go back to basics <clears throat> with Islam, there's nothing cuddly about it. So yeah eventually we'll always go back to what it's supposed to because the Quran is still there and the Hadith are still there. And so you can't change all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I want to say too, that it they have tried in the past. So you mentioned the Sufis and the mysticism, there's Ahmadis, there's, you know, the, lots of different groups of Muslims have tried to be less uh, violent and than the, and less political than the uh, mainstream 90% of Muslims who are the Sunni practicing uh, conservatives. I don't know if there's 90% conservative, but there's definitely 90% Sunni. Mm -hmm. um, and all of those have always failed. So yeah. Sufis are killed all over the planet. Ahmadis are killed all over the planet. Like they're not successful in reforming the religion. So when we talk about reforming it again through the new group, so now Majid Nawaz or Asra Namani or whoever, you know, how do we know it's not gonna fail in the same way that it has always failed in the past? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the answer is it probably will, <laughs> but I am still going to support something working towards a good goal, even though I don't think that it's very likely to happen. And the other example that I give for this is when we talk about gun reform in the United States. 
So gun reform or a gun or sorry, reform of gun laws mm -hmm. in the United States. That's very likely not going to happen in our lifetime. It's something very, very difficult. Um, most Americans don't want or a large swaths of powerful Americans don't want to reform the gun laws. So that's not going to prevent me, even though I'm not American, it's not going to prevent me from still supporting and hoping that Americans will reform their gun laws. And I'm the outside looking in with Americans and I'm the outside looking in with Muslims too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't really care. I'm not invested in what happens in with Americans and I'm not invested with what happens with Muslims, but I do, a result of that could affect me. A result, I, I'm next door neighbors with Americans. So when they reform their gun laws, it will be, I'll be safer. Yeah, yeah. And every human being on the planet would be safer if Muslims were to reform their laws in, yeah. in their religion. Absolutely. So I'll support that, even though I don't really see it um, actually happening in real life ever. Mm -hmm. But uh, they're, they're, the goals that they're working towards, goals of humanism and, you know, women's equality and LGBT equality and all of the things that they believe in are things that I believe in too. So I don't see how not supporting them would be beneficial in any way. Yeah, I would say, um, I mean, as you said, uh, it happened a lot in the past of Islam. It happened in the, in the 11th century that that uh, other people, that rationalists, wanted to uh, sort of sort of instate their the tesalites. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 mm -hmm. which, which was cracked down on and basically, uh, you know, it, it was exterminated. Totally yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And um, the, the, the same thing happened with Sufis. Sufis so, somehow took the banner of Islam and tried to make that uh, the, the, the majority of Islam, but it didn't work out in the end. Now, the, the thing is that um, people, especially now globally in the West, because they know about the history of Christianity, somehow want to give this comparison that uh, Christianity did a reform and Islam can too, but it's it's not the same because Christianity didn't create some new peaceful religion. The, 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 the aim of Christianity was to go back to, to to the to the root of Christianity but Islam is already at the root of Islam and it's horrible <laughs> yeah so the thing that Christianity has that Islam does not have is the New Testament mm -hmm. so if most if Christians were all trying to follow the Old Testament we'd be fucked as a planet like we'd be screwed we have the Muslims following the Quran and the Christians following the Old Testament that's it we're all gone mm -hmm. but luckily they have the New Testament and that's that overrides the the old testament and all the horrible things in it so well for most christians anyway not all um so luckily they have that new book to follow and also luckily they have a pope and they or well the catholics do anyway but they have a human being who can look at their religion today and make decisions based on what works for human beings in 2018 muslims don't have that Mm -hmm. Muhammad taught that every generation of Muslims after him is worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. Yeah. And to get to the best Muslims, you have to go all the way to the first generation of Muslims. So that boomerang is always going to happen. Mm -hmm. And every Muslim, regardless of what year it is, is always going to feel like they're living in the worst year for Muslims, the worst generation of Muslims. Right now, this is the worst generation of Muslims because it's the current generation, right? Yeah. Last yeah. generation was a little bit less worse and then going back and back and back. So they're always going to be trying to go back to that horrible, horrible example that he put forth. And that's yeah. why you end up with ISIS. Well, I'm totally glad that uh, Muslims don't have a big head of the religion, or Sunnis at least, don't have a big head of the religion that uh, commands everyone to do this and to do that. I mean, it, it never worked very well in the history of Islam. Well, uh, it would be worse. Us. It would be worse unless it was somebody like a Aga Khan or somebody who was willing to be open-minded. And I mean, even that, some Aga Khans were horrible. I'm just yeah. talking about this current one is is open-minded. But yeah, you're right. That That could go... That could go very badly as well because they're all just they're all mindless drones yeah so if they have somebody tell them something you know like what is it lemurs that all leap off of the cliff like they all just they're, they're all gonna just follow so if mm -hmm. the guy tells them to do something evil they're all gonna go ahead and just do that because that's what he said to do that's how it worked in the past i mean um 
I, I want to sort of I want to kind of make a make a correction about some uh, Sufi thing that I said before, uh, just to just to explain this issue too. I mean, when when a caliphate was there in the past, when there was a caliph who led the entire uh, Islamic world, then uh, the Sufis who were more into into mysticism and love and stuff like that more than legalism were also the ones who were all ready waiting for the order of the caliphate to go and fight against. Uh, against the infidel against the yeah i learned that from you and i didn't know that until i heard you say that on one of your videos i honestly thought that sufis were just you know they just do the twirling and the singing no. <laughs> i thought that they were like the kabbalah of islam like kabbalah is to judaism well they are sort of in the real life you know that it's it's like um sufis if you go back into the history of Sufis, uh, Sufism was basically created by people who weren't able to really follow uh, the legalism of Islam because they were not they were not Arabic and it didn't make very much sense to them. So they sort of created this 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 mystical interpretation and this uh, personal connection to Allah, personal connection to Muhammad, and uh, representants of Muhammad among us in our time and lots of bullshit like that. Uh, they created that. You know, they they weren't very fond of just ruling. Exactly by what the Quran and what the Hadith say, but they were but they were respecting it and they were always ready to raise their sword and fight for it. I mean, mm. in their daily life, they were just among each other and uh, just thinking of love and stuff like that. But they were still advisors of 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 the Ottoman of the Ottoman uh, monarchs, for example. So not pacifists by any means. Absolutely not. Wow. I mean, uh, Turkish sources have uh, are, are full of that. That Sufis were uh, that Sufi leaders, many of them were close friends with the with the Ottoman sultans, and that they gave them clear advices on on how to war, on how to go, and how to uh, conquer what's in front of them. And the Sufis would come together and pray for the victory of the Ottoman Empire, for example. And it, it was sort of the same in 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 the empires and the caliphates before that, but. Uh, uh, Sufis were collectively by no, in, no means uh, a, a group of, you know, pacifists and peace lovers and something like so that. So I guess that's the answer to our question. You know, every time Islam tries to be reformed in any positive direction, it always boomerangs right back to... Mm -hmm to violence for all other groups. Absolutely. India, for example, is a, is a good example. We have a lot of Indian uh, viewers here uh, who should know about their history. I mean, um, India was in, was invaded and overruled and ruled very often by 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 Muslims, Muslims. that were very close to to to, to 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 the Sufism form of Islam, and they weren't peaceful at all to India. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's 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 it's. I mean, Sufism seems kind of peaceful from the outside, but it's really not that way. And I was in it. I, I, I practiced it for years, and it's definitely not peaceful. It just teaches a peaceful life for yourself, but uh, it teaches complete hate and intolerance about anything that is not for Allah. Which is basically. So, what is your the opinion on the on on the reformers or about this reform movement? Because most of the reformers come from a Sufi background, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which makes and, sense. Yeah. Well, um, I, I'm I'm still very split about that. To be to be honest, I mean, uh, I made some statements about it before, some some different statements later. I share my opinion sometimes. I'm still quite split about that, and uh, I think I don't know. I think it's it's stupid. I think it's it won't happen. The majority of Muslims won't join a new reformed form of Islam, but. Uh, I also gladly accept any form of good corruption of the Islamic faith. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> yeah, I think we're on the same page with that. Yeah. yeah, to be very honest, that's why I can support people like, I don't know, Imam Tawhidi or Majid Nawaz and stuff like that. I, I, won't, I won't actively engage in that, but I can totally uh, support them in what they're doing. Exactly. Like I myself will never call myself a reformer and then try to reform the religion. No, I don't care. But at the same time, I'm not going to... Like I will support them because, like you said, they're 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 trying to um, corrupt <laughs> yeah. Islam, which is a which is a good thing. It needs to be it needs to be shook up and it needs to be changed and it needs to be cherry picked and large parts of it need to be thrown in the garbage. And so I'll I'll support anybody who's working towards yeah. that goal. Muslims need to be introduced to haram things, you know. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> they need yeah. to be exposed to all those things that they can't do right 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 be front in front of them that would yes. definitely change their religion yes and I, and i'm fine with that <laughs> totally agree with that and it's much easier for all these reformers to work in australia and america and the uk and things like that or places like that but it, it's really hard when you're in a country like the Maldives, which is 100% Sunni Muslims, yeah. or you're in Egypt, which is like 90, over 90% Muslim, or all of these other countries, which are in the 90s, they're, they're pretty high Muslim majority countries. And it's all in the government, it's in the schooling, it's in the media, it's in everything. Mm -hmm. So it's much, much harder to reform the religion in those kinds of places. Yeah. But at least if they're willing to accept that there's such thing as agnostics there's such thing as gay people there's such thing as all of these kinds of people that they want to pretend don't exist mm -hmm. then that's a, for them that's like a huge i mean it's not reform but it just to open their mind just a crack and mm -hmm. let a little bit of sunlight in I'll be happy to see that. Yeah, I see many developments in uh, in in countries. I don't know. I have I have even notes of that. I I don't know where they are right now, but uh, I I seen developments from Saudi Arabia, from Jordan, from Turkey, mm -hmm. and some other countries where 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 the sheikhs and uh, authorities, where imams and people like that, uh, openly started talking about the danger of atheism among our youth, which just makes me so happy. Yeah, <laughs> me too. <laughs> That's good. But where you see yeah. someone in Saudi Arabia, a sheikh in Saudi Arabia saying yeah. we have to, you know, deal with this now. It is becoming a problem. That just yeah. makes me happy. It's happening. It is. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah. In Saudi Arabia, they deemed atheism equal to terrorism. Yeah. That's how scared they are of us. Mm -hmm. So good. Be scared because yeah. we come with truth and, and, you know, rational thinking and you can't beat that with your fairy tale garbage. Yeah. Yeah. In Turkey, for example, there was this there was this guy that I used to uh, I knew him when I was still a Muslim, but I didn't agree with him very much. But um, only two years ago, as far as I remember, uh, he made this tweet on his Twitter, which is followed by lots of people saying that um, saying that atheism and apostasy and other faiths are becoming a serious problem among our youth and no one knows why it's happening. We must no all come knows. together to solve this problem. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just, I was just so glad. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's happy news for sure. And I think that in a lot of those countries, honestly, if they do, if they separate mosque and state, if they allow people to think and allow people freedom of thought and freedom of, of religion and freedom of no religion, mm -hmm. then things will definitely change in those countries. But that's why they don't want to separate mosque and state because they, they are scared, like you said, mm -hmm. and they know that this is the way to, to keep such a tight hold on your citizens is with, with, with Islam and with the fear of death if you try to leave the religion. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, speaking of leaving the religion, I want to ask you, uh, did you have this phase to, I mean, everyone has that probably, like w w when you leave a religion, when you leave an, an ideology that repressed you so much like Islam, uh, I myself started after that going into some sort of depression, but then also mm -hmm. exploring myself so much, doing all the things that I couldn't do before and getting interested in so many things. Uh, mm -hmm. Did, did you have that phase too like of self-exploration? My phase was really different because I had a baby. So I was very focused on her and making sure that I protected her and making sure that she had a, a good life. So my focus was mainly on getting through my university and getting a good job and making sure that she never knew what it was like uh, to that for when all those years when we were living hand to mouth, I didn't want her to remember any of those years. I didn't want her to remember any of the years living in basement suites and not having enough money to buy her milk. Even I didn't, I wanted to get myself um, successful before she could, before she had any memories of any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So that was my main focus all the time. And that, actually saved me from the loneliness and the depression. It happened, of course, I was very scared all of those years, but I didn't have time to harp on it because I was sleep deprived because <laughs> I was going to school full time and I was working and I was taking care of a baby and I just had too many, um, just, it was survival. I just had to survive all those years. And 
once every, the dust started to settle and I started to, I was in a good job and, you know, everything is, is sort of calmer in my life. That's when the depression hit me pretty badly. Mm -hmm. And it, ha I've been fighting it for, for years, but it's, it's, it's getting a lot better because I'm now acknowledging it. Whereas before I used to just ignore it and just keep, 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 keep going, keep going, keep going. And, um, you know, that's no way to deal with it. It's going to continue to follow you. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, it is unfathomably difficult to have all of the answers and to think, you know, everything and to be so positive in your, just this, just, certitude just this moral certitude and to, uh, to know why you're on this planet and to know everything there's no question that you don't have the answer to mm -hmm. and to go from that to literally not knowing anything yeah <laughs> like there's no answer to anything it is so so scary everything I, I built my life upon is suddenly a lie that's absolutely absolutely i don't know if you ever watched the movie the truman show yeah yeah it was exactly like the truman show for me like i just i hit that wall and i realized oh my god this is all the movie set like this is all fake or like neo in the matrix or something like you just, the shock of, of, of everything you've ever believed, everything you've ever known, everything that you think makes up who you are as a human being is just a lie. And then you have to rebuild yourself brick by brick. And each one of those bricks, you have to pick it up and turn it over and think about it and try to find, is this the right brick? Is this the, is this the, the thought that I want to have in my mind right now? Is this the value system? Is this the belief that I want to, to be a part of me? And you can't refer to a book to find out if it's yeah. the right thing or not. You have to just figure it out. Yeah. And it, it was, yeah, it's, it was so hard because I also had that extra added pressure of, I needed to get my shit together so that I could raise my daughter right. So if mm -hmm. I didn't have the proper value system, how was I going to be able to to teach her proper values? Yeah, that's that's a hard thing. So it was, yeah, it was a difficult time. And um, yeah, I know a lot of ex-Muslims kind of went through this, you know, Catholic schoolgirl phase where you're totally repressed. And then all of a sudden you're like, freedom, you know, I'm going to go drinking and clubbing and have sex with everybody and you know, I never got to go through that phase because I was just too busy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, for, for people that do go through it, I think it's a really natural and healthy response to being so repressed. But I personally also didn't go through it because the repression didn't leave me in a heartbeat. You know, yeah. the repression was very slow. So even though I took off hijab, um, I didn't wear shorts till like a few years ago. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I still was nervous about wearing short skirts or wearing heels or wearing anything. Cause I'd be like, Oh my God, people are going to think I'm a whore. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah, I just yeah. would feel really bad about myself. And I had this thing. Um, I had this weird attitude towards pork, you know, after yeah. I left Islam, years after I left it's Islam. It's the I last still, thing to leave yeah. you is the pork. Yeah. I was, I was still sitting in front of it and, and I'm like, I somehow can't eat this. I don't know why. You know? Yeah. There was something in my head that was, that was holding me back from doing that. It, it really took a lot of time until I get used to it. Yeah. It feels <laughs> like it's the most powerful thing. I don't know why, but it's the most powerful thing you can do, even Muslims will do anything and everything against their religion, but they will still not touch bacon. Yeah. And, and ex Muslims, I mean, it took me a long, I was talking to an ex Muslim friend of mine. He's been ex Muslim for over 10 years. He's like, yes, when we see each other, let's, let's eat pork sausages. <laughs> he's never <laughs> eaten pork yet. I'm like, are you kidding? <laughs> like he's an open gay man. Like he's totally everything about his life is free, but he still will not eat pork. It's just <laughs> crazy. <laughs> Give me goosebumps by the way, by comparing all of this to the, to the Truman show, but you yeah. should, have, but you should have said uh, spoiler alert. Uh, oh. I'll just did it for you here. For people that haven't watched <laughs> movies from the 80s, yeah. spoiler alert. <laughs> uh, <laughs> or uh, 90s. I don't know. I don't even know. 
don't whatever. even know. A long time ago. <laughs> uh, let's talk about the the favorite Islamic topic, the hijab. Uh, uh, yeah. So um, you, you wore that, right? I mean, during yeah. your normal life in your Islamic time. I wore hijab from the age of nine, and I wore niqab from the age of 19, 1920. Sick. And uh, <laughs> uh, when you left Islam, did you immediately get rid of that? or? No, I did not. So I left, actually, I left my daughter's father, and it was months later before, I, I, to be honest, it was closer to a year later, mm -hmm. <laughs> before I actually even took off the niqab. Because even removing, even showing my face felt like I was walking around topless. And I was with a friend of mine who is a hijabi. She's a hijabi Egyptian woman. Like, and she was like, just because my mom wasn't there and I had no family around. And so she was like, just, just take it off your face. Like, just show your face. And I was like, I can't, I can't. And she was like, just do it. Like, let's just, just try once. Let's go out together without, without you covering your face. And... I was really nervous. I felt like everybody was going to be looking at me for some reason. I don't know. I thought it was, I thought it was just, I felt like I was exposed. Mm -hmm. And when I uncovered my face, literally nobody cared. Yeah. <laughs> like less people looked at me than when my face was covered, but it just, I just felt naked. And then it took, and then it was a slow unveiling after that. I took off the abaya, which is the big cloak thing that you wear. Um, and then I started to, you know, wear pants and then it was like a shorter hijab, not mm -hmm. quite the big long one. And, and then it was just slowly, 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 slowly before I, I finally removed everything. I was close to 30 by the time that happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's and it was, I was doing it part time for a long time and oh, so much drama, but yeah, it was not, it was not just like a rip it off. I think it's different for people these days because they have the support online. If I had yeah. other people that I was talking to, if I had seen a video of a woman burning a hijab, like you get to see online now, like there, the, the, there's that hashtag in Saudi Arabia that was big about burning the niqab. Well, if I had seen... Fun. If I had seen that kind of thing, I would have felt more, um, I guess, more courageous. And I would have done it a lot quicker because mm -hmm. I wouldn't have felt quite so alone. And you know how it is when you're Muslim, they make you feel like if you do something that's against Islam, it, you're so filthy. You know, like the more you cover yourself up, the better you are. Yeah. And the less covered you are, the more disgusting of a decrepit little human being you are. Mm -hmm. So it's just, you you feel like you're choosing to be a disgusting, filthy, uncovered woman. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's just that, that that's the mindset that they, that they had built in me from a young age. So I had to, to undo all of that brainwashing was, was hard work. What what I think about is it may sound weird to to many viewers and to many people, but you know, uh, since I grew up in such a an observing family, as even as a man, I was I was told so often to uh, to to be modest with my dressing. For example, my parents didn't allow me when I was a child and when I was a teenager, not not child. Let's say when I was a teenager, my parents wouldn't uh, allow me to to wear uh, shorts that go above my knees because that's that's uh, immodest and wrong and bad and horrible. Which is mm. why they never bought me such stuff. I never had that. I couldn't wear that. And people would would ask me, "Why aren't you wearing shorts? Shorts is so hot." I said, and I couldn't. In Germany, they like to wear speedos. You didn't yeah. wear speedos like all the other Germans. <laughs> <laughs> it's good you're in America where nobody oh. wears speedos. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I compare that, you know, I think I had, I felt that pain and that, that despair, and that weird thing as a man, just yeah. because of my shorts. And I can't even imagine what a, what Your a woman goes, th goes through. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's, and all of that is attached to not just your own honor, but your whole family's honor. Yeah. So yeah. when you uncover your hair or when you uncover your arms or your legs or your face, you're not just, you know, you're not just making yourself a disgusting human being, but you're now making your whole family look bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was always told that by my family. Don't do this. Don't ask that question. Don't say this. What will all the uh, all our friends People. say about you? Yeah. God.
<laughs> my mom used to say that all the time. What will the people say? Yeah. I'm like, who are the people? Are we royal family <laughs> or something? <laughs> who are the people? I, don't I still joke with my wife about that because, you know, I, I got so much used to it in my time that people told me all the time, I don't know, that my mom uh, said all the time, what will the people say? What will those people say? What will our neighbors say? And I'm, I, I hate that thought. I hate that way of thinking. I don't give a shit about what people say. You know? yeah. but I, I joke so much with my wife about that now. That's that's it. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's something that I talked about with um, other friends of mine that grew up in different communities, like Hasidic Jewish communities or Mormon communities. That's also a common thing in all of these cults like religions. And the idea is that you all have to keep an eye on each other. Right. That's how you yeah. that's how you perpetuate this is because if you allow individuality of thought or of action, then you lose Plot, right mm -hmm. so you have to constantly everybody's policing each other all the time yeah. and the women police like oh my god the women police the women way more than the men police yeah. the women yeah i can confirm that <laughs> yes <laughs> um how how would you i i know you probably described this a lot in your uh in, in your speeches in your and stuff that you write on twitter and so on but how would you describe um the comparison from being a hijabi as you were back then to to now as open how would you describe describe your feeling then and now i think the biggest difference is just honesty is mm -hmm. now i'm my honest self i'm referring to uh, to movies all the time but another movie was um I don't know if you saw this. It was called Mulan. It's a Disney movie yeah. about a girl. Okay. So there is a song in, in the Mulan movie where she looks at her reflection in the water and she says, when will the girl I see staring back at me reflect who I am inside or something like that? And I literally cried when I heard that line. I was a hijabi and I was like, that is exactly how I feel because walking around as a hijabi, you're basically, it's like a big red neon sign that says Muslim mm -hmm. and that's it. So I'm not Yasmin. I'm not an individual. I'm not a human being. I'm just Muslim girl. And you're restricted to that label. That's it. And everything that I did and everything that I said reflected not only on me, but on the entire fucking religion of Islam and every single individual member of the Muslim Ummah. Like you, it's such a responsibility to put that thing on your head and all of a sudden you can't be yourself. Mm -hmm. You have to be everything that is expected of you by this religion. And nobody judges you as a human being. Everybody just judges you as a Muslim girl. They don't get to know you as a person because there's this barrier blocking you from them. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so I was, and remember when earlier when we were talking about inside voice and outside voice, inside the house, I was told, you know, you put that on or nobody will respect you. You'll never get married, blah, blah, blah. And outside the house, it's like, oh, she wants to wear, wear this. It's her choice. She likes it. And so. Did you come around saying that too to people? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because I had Stockholm syndrome majorly. And. Even though I knew all of the sexism in Islam, I would also want to consider myself a feminist too, just like all of these other clueless idiots walking around that mm -hmm. call themselves Muslim feminists. I was one of them. I'd be like, yeah, I'm a feminist. It's like, oh, are you a Muslim? Yeah, but Muhammad gave all the rights to Muslim women. <laughs> I would say that. I would say that. I never said he was the first feminist. But I did say that, yeah, he gave he gave women are queens in Islam. What does that mean specifically? What does that mean? Because because uh, from where I'm standing, they they're m there's a hadith that says women are less intelligent than men. Yeah. It's you know the Quran states that women should get less inheritance than men. That they're uh, in a in a court of law that their testimony is only worth half of a man's. So give me specific examples of how this religion is feminist in any way or you know or that muhammad was a feminist in any way there's no specific examples it's very general bullshit that you just regurgitate like oh no he gave all the rights to muslim women khadija was all of the khadija examples can i just say that was pre-islam people always forget mm -hmm. that they're like yeah, oh yeah. she was a a, a a businesswoman and she was a this she was a that that's because she wasn't muslim
Yeah, that that should be a sign, actually. That should actually be a sign, because because uh, Muslims always go around saying, "Well, before Islam, women were treated like this, and yeah, you know, women was respected." The Jahiliya. Well, yeah. What about Khadija? What she's, about Khadija? She's a perfect example <laughs> of how that's a big fat lie. Yeah. After yeah. Islam, he marries a six-year-old. That's the difference. Mm -hmm. Pre-Islam and post-Islam. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Anyway, so yeah, basically hijab, wearing the hijab was a big fat lie and I never felt like myself. And so taking it off, being being able to live as I am today is just, I get to live honestly. I get to be my true self. Yeah. And I honestly do feel like when people who are transgendered talk about when they were forced to live as another gender, and then when they're finally able to live as a woman or to live as a man, and the reading their testimonies and stuff like that, I'm like, oh my God, that's, you know, I know that it's, it's, it's on a completely different scale, but that's how I felt when I took off the hijab and when I was able to just be myself, I was like, finally, the real me can come out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You're, you're doing a lot of, a lot for it now too. I mean, I see you share lots of stuff about the hijab on, on Twitter, which is uh, very good. I mean, you, you are really in that position to, to sort of, uh, to to be active for that to 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 make that your voice to to sort of lead that among us here. <laughs> yeah, I think the hijab is symbolic, though. Like, I think that that woman that I have removing the hijab on the the Syrian woman when she left ISIS territory, that's uh -huh. very symbolic yeah, of yeah. just freedom. Yes. Just take this religious shit off my body and let the let me fly, let me soar as who I am inside. That's really how I how I view this whole uh, hijab thing. That's why I fight against it because to me it's symbolic of all of this just religious constraints. You know what's interesting? This um, you know a, a woman taking the whole responsibility for Islam altogether when she's when she when she wears a hijab is is not only a thing that's going on in the West. You know, it's it's also just as much going in, on in countries like Turkey, for example, where I spent a decade. Uh, I mean, even even people there have this thing like, you know, some some women don't wear the hijab in Turkey because Turkey is rather a free freer country compared to all the others. But even there, when someone wears the hijab and does something that is uh, considered inappropriate in Islam, people around will still go to her and will be like, "What are you doing? You are wearing the hijab. Yes. You should behave like it." Yes, <laughs> get that all the time. Uh, yeah. There was some girl that was dancing in the streets in the UK and like the entire Muslim Ummah, they all had to create these YouTube videos talking about this random anonymous girl. How dare she dance in the streets while she's wearing hijab, you know, like, so fuck you. <laughs> like you cannot be, you can't even dance if you want to dance. If you're wearing hijab, you can't do anything. So it encourages people to not wear it because you want to just be living freely and anonymously and not have everybody looking at everything you do under an islamic microscope there are there are youtubers i mean i don't want to mention their names now but there are uh, quite big uh, muslim youtubers who have uh, a, who have very huge follower counts here on on youtube who uh, openly made like shaming videos before you know like showing videos and pictures of 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 women in the hijab and uh inappropriate stuff that they're doing without covering their face at all and just uh talking to their audience and criticizing this criticizing the woman who is doing that openly yeah. shaming those people you know we, we people can just see it easily on youtube we are not talking about something that's not existing yeah <laughs> anyway um <clears throat> sorry uh, one final thing that I would want to go into with you before we go answering questions is uh, what is your advice for um, skeptic Muslims and uh, ex-Muslims, especially women, I would say, who live in, um, in religious Muslim families in the West or in the Islamic world? What would be your advice for them as, a, as an ex-Muslim woman? Okay, so we got a bunch of different groups there. The first group are skeptic Muslims. For them, I would recommend read the Quran. Mm -hmm. And if after you finish reading the Quran, you're still Muslim, start to read the Hadith. And then come join me on Twitter because you will be an ex-Muslim. 
it shouldn't take long after reading Sahih yeah. Bukhari. If you want to read yes. it, it shouldn't really take long. That will <laughs> you will either become a jihadi or you'll become an ex-Muslim. Those yeah. are your two choices. There's there's no third option. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's what I say. If you're a skeptic Muslim, learn your religion. Read it in your native tongue. Do not believe the bullshit where they tell you it has to be read in Arabic. It has to be understood in Arabic. No. I understand Arabic is my first language and I can read the Quran and I can tell you for a fact it is way worse in Arabic because the English translations have been um, whitewashed so that they're not quite as aggressive so that when the English speaking people read it, it doesn't sound as bad. Yeah. But it's bad enough. <laughs> it will still do the trick. Uh, so read the read the Quran in your native language and uh, don't go to imams who are just going to tell you whatever. Don't go to anybody. Just use your own brain. Read the literal word of Allah. Read what Allah is saying to you. And uh, yeah, and then like I say, then read the uh, hadith. So that's what I say to Muslims. Um, to ex-Muslims, I say to the ones that are here in the free Western world, I say congratulations on your freedom, but please don't just turn around and walk away. Mm -hmm. Please extend your hand to the other ex-Muslims in your community. If you're in the middle, if you're in the uh, in North America, join ex-Muslims of North America. If you're in Britain, join Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain. Just join the new ex-Muslim Ummah and help out other people. Join the Reddit for ex-Muslim. You know, there's lots of different places that you could join. And even if it's not physically face-to-face, -face, even if it's just online, be there to support all of the people that are going through the journey that you went through because you know how difficult and how lonely it was. Yeah. Um, so that's what I have to say to the ex-Muslims over here. Uh, ex-Muslims over there. Uh, I never hang know in there. <laughs> hang in there. Uh, I guess it's the same sort of advice, but much quieter. Be very quiet about it. But there are ex-Muslim groups in Pakistan, in Egypt, even in Saudi Arabia. They're very yeah, quiet they're and they're very careful, yes. And if you are in any of those countries and you want to join in with other ex-Muslim in those countries, then you can contact me, contact me through my website or contact me through Free Hearts, Free Minds. And I will get you in touch with people who are trusted groups that you can interact with, especially women in Saudi Arabia. They, those are the group that are the most, I mean, we talk about suicide watch and depression and stuff like that in our context. It's nothing compared to what these women are going through. Mm -hmm. And to just be able to speak to another human being openly that you can trust, that that will hear you and not demonize you for having these questions, can literally can save lives. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just find each other, help each other out. And uh, I can't remember if there's any other groups I was supposed to give advice to. I think that's it. That's <laughs> okay. So sorry for the very long question. That's okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, let's do the following. I've seen I've seen a lot of lot of questions, guys. So many, but we are in such a great conversation. Thank you so much, Yasmin. Uh, Thank you for having me. <laughs> so. You, you, you can go ahead and ask questions now. I think we should we could now start uh, going into those questions, answering them together. I would prefer that uh, that Yasmin uh, answers more of the questions. That the questions are more uh, directed toward Yasmin. I'm always here, guys. Uh, <laughs> so wait, I'm, I made a note of an early question actually. Um... No, oh, okay. This was a super chat question. The question was uh, the question came from. Dominic, and was as ex-Muslims, do you still support non-medical circumcisions of boys? I personally don't think that there's any reason to cut the genitals of a baby um, unless there's some medical reason for it. I, I don't see why we would ever do that to healthy children, male or female. Yeah. 
I, I from my side, I can say I'm not. Uh, I, don't, I don't talk very much about different topics here on my channel, but uh, I think it's a very useless, very stupid thing. People make excuses about it, like oh, it has these health benefits and that health benefit, but it's it, it's not true. That's like that's like cutting part of your finger off and saying, well, it has some health benefits. I mean, I did it for a reason. <laughs> Come on, <laughs> yeah. Thanks. I agree thanks. with that. Thanks, Dominic. Uh, I'll just, the questions, the participation is huge. I'm not used to this. The questions are uh, a lot. So I'll just answer whatever I can see here or just tell the question to you, whatever. Um, question for ex-Muslim women. I asked it already just a few minutes ago. Come on, more questions. <laughs> There, there is, a, there has a, there have a hilarious conversations been going on. Since oh we've been yes, <laughs> that used to happen when I was on Secular Jihadist too. I'm trying to read the questions, but there's all these people just having yeah, conversations, yeah. and I'm like, scroll, yeah. scroll, scroll. Yeah. What do you think of Shabir Ali? Asked by 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 Gerard Perry. Thank you, Gerard. I honestly have no idea who that is. You don't know who Shabir? Oh, that's a uh, Shabir. Shabir Ali. It's. Shabir Ali or whatever I don't know I don't even know how, how his name is said it's a it's a Muslim apologist who's working in the UK I think he's more uh, an, a nicer person compared to the compared to most Muslim apologists um, you, you know Vidovitz right he has a channel yeah. Yeah. yeah, he he had recently a conversation with him, actually. Oh, it says he's a Canadian Muslim preacher who serves as the president of the Islamic Information and Dawah Center in Toronto, Ontario? No? Yeah, I have no idea where so he is. Him? I have okay. no idea where he is. Okay. I, I, I should know him. He's Canadian, but... Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, I don't have an opinion about him I try to avoid either. Muslims. <laughs> me, me too. <laughs> So there's some that I can't help but know about, like the really big ones. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, I'm not really paying attention to what different Muslim preachers are doing and saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, people say that all the time to me because I'm making a YouTube channel here and talking about various issues about Islam, that I should uh, care about this Muslim apologist and that Muslim preacher and I should have debates. But I don't. I really don't think that's part of what I'm doing here. No. I shouldn't even be doing that. I don't see any point in debating Muslims. I agree. I yeah. totally agree with that. I won't even I hardly ever debate with the ones that come onto my Twitter page. Most of the time I just ignore them. Mm -hmm. Or if they say something, you know, incredibly heinous, then I might respond with something snarky or rude. Mm -hmm. But very, very rarely do I actually get into debate and conversation because very rarely do I get a Muslim who is saying something to me which is actually an argument which yeah. is actually coming from a place of rational thinking and if they do then of course i'm going to engage with mm -hmm. a normal human being but most of the time it's just very hateful stuff yeah this is also to all the uh the muslims who are watching um i i see very often just comments i mean 95 percent, i would say of uh comments coming from muslims that are critical uh, just say stuff like oh you don't know anything about islam mm. oh you mm. need to do this oh you don't know that people Stop. tell me i need to read the quran in arabic <laughs> <laughs> They're like, they're like, you need to learn your religion. Like I, this is why I was saying I could out Muslim any of these people, honestly, yeah, yeah, yeah. like absolutely none of them. And, and I think it's the same for you too. And this is where the problem lies. There's a lot of Muslims that like you and me, we actually lived as Muslims. Mm -hmm. And, but there are a lot of Muslims, Muslim reformers, ex-Muslims out there today that grew up in families where nobody wore hijab everybody yeah. was drinking alcohol you know they didn't do anything except for maybe go to Eid prayer once a year and then they start to talk about the experience of living as a muslim and i'm like mm -hmm. please sit down because you did not experience living as a muslim you experienced living in a in an islamic cultural yeah. family but that's not that's mm -hmm. not at all the same as living as a Muslim in a Muslim country or with an actual practicing family. I mean, some of these people I speak to, they're like, oh no, we never even prayed. I didn't even know how to pray. I'm like, what? How do you? <laughs> That's yeah. like, all my day was consumed by prayer. That's all yeah. I ever did. I used to spend hours just at night just praying to Allah, doing doing those additional prayers that, you yeah. know, the voluntary the prayers sunnah. and stuff like that. Yeah. 
I, many Muslims think uh, because they see all those uh, Muslims outside who are basically just cultural Muslims and don't really do much, they think that ex-Muslims uh, are also a result of that, but it's not. Yeah, yeah. or they many think we're us, exaggerating because yeah. they know that this this guy, Mike, his real name is, you know, Mustafa, and we call <laughs> him Mike at work, and he goes to for a beer with us and da-da-da, so therefore all Muslims are like Mike. No, no. they're not. <laughs> Yeah. We were both uh, practicing Muslims. We both came from conservative families and we, we, we learned Islam. We practiced Islam for so long. And of course, we speak against it. It's equating us to, the, to those cultural Muslims who never cared about their religion. It's just, it makes no sense. It's stupid. Totally agree. Um, now, Tanki, thanks you for thank you for the question. Now, Tanki asked you, how is your life after leaving Islam? I believe you answered that mostly, but... If you want to yeah it's just every now and then even just like you know walking along the beach with my husband holding hands and i'll stop and i'll just be like i can't believe this is my life sorry there's my my neighbors are mowing their lawn oh, that's uh, <laughs> I, I just can't believe this is my life because there were so many points in my life which when my book finally comes out one day you'll read it there were so many times when it could have gone in another direction so easily mm -hmm. and it's just like a miracle that everything worked out the way that it did and that i'm that i'm free today you know mm -hmm. as, as free as i could possibly be mm -hmm. i think that it's my daughters who are truly free because they never have to overcome all of the brainwashing and garbage and all of the damage that it does to your psyche and to your body and mentally and psychologically all that stuff i'm never gonna get rid of it i'm never gonna lose the anxiety and the depression and all that stuff i'm just gonna have to learn how to deal with it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but um gratefully my daughters never had to overcome the brainwashing so they're Absolutely. they're truly the free ones mm -hmm. i would i would totally agree with that um miles yoshimoto asked thanks miles uh how dangerous is your living as an ex-muslim how, how, how dangerous do you think it is? I don't like answering this question. I don't like thinking about this question. Um, I never tell my husband anymore about the death threats because every time I used to tell him before, because I'd be really shook up and upset. And so you want to share it with somebody you care about. He would go and buy like some other security system for the house. <laughs> so, so now I've stopped telling him because it stresses him out. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, before I opened my mouth for the very first time, before I put my face on the screen for the very first time, I had to think that one day there was the potential that I might end up living like Ion Hercieli with mm -hmm. like, and that had to be something that I had to be okay with. I had to mm -hmm. understand that if I'm going to do this, I have to do it fully. I can't half-ass it. And that means that that could end up being my future. And I still decided to go forward. Um, I think what I'm doing is speaking for a lot of people who cannot speak for themselves and being a voice for the voiceless. And so I feel like I have to do it regardless of, of how dangerous it is. I have to just keep doing it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a stressful thing to even think about, let alone talk about. Uh, I, I would say, by the way, that uh, although many 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 people think the opposite, I think that I'm not in a in a very big danger, especially since I'm in the in the United States. Uh, I don't think that every Muslim out there wants to kill me or wants to kill you. It's probably it's no. mostly those very very sick people who yeah. are filled with hate who, who would come come and do something like that for a bigger organization. I totally agree. I think that the thing that scared me the most was my ex's um, connections. I wasn't sure if he still had friends that he could send my way. So that was that's where my biggest uh, fears come from. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um what is the usual Muslim response to your, um, I, I, I'm not talking about all the social media response, I'm not talking about all the people that send you stupid crap online, but uh, if you encounter Muslims 
outside, for example, how do they deal with your opinions and your being an ex-Muslim? Or do you have any interactions like that at all? Yeah, 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 they do. They're very shocked. They're very surprised that I have the audacity. <laughs> they get, they, they get, uh, it's not, it's not the same kind of anger that you get online, which is very like rape, fuck, shit, blah, but it's, it's much quieter. Um, but it's that sort of disbelief, like, how could you? Mm -hmm. Because um, it's, it's just not something that has ever crossed their mind as real or as possible. And I think that things are changing now. It's becoming much more acceptable. And, but in the past, I've had some very strong reactions by Muslims mm -hmm. face to face. Mm -hmm. um, now, like there are certain people that I've worked with that will find out that I used to be Muslim and then they'll just avoid me. Mm -hmm. So I'll have, I'll have that kind of, which is, a, that's, I think the most typical experience online too, is people see Yasmin Muhammad and then they're like, oh, chit chat, chit chat. And then they're like, oh my God, she's next Muslim block. <laughs> <laughs> So that's, I think, the most typical. You see reaction. people blocking you without even interacting with you. Oh yeah, all yeah. the time, all the yeah, time. Me too. I, 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 I saw something like someone mentioned uh, me on Twitter on someone else's uh, tweet, and then I go on that page and I'm blocked for no reason. Yeah, I didn't even I have an interaction. What the hell? I'm like, now I've disappeared. <laughs> now, now I'm no longer on the planet because you blocked me. It's like a little kid going la 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 la. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like okay. <laughs> sure, block me if you want. I'm still here and I'm still talking and I still do. I haven't, it hasn't affected me in any way. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, whoever asked the question, by the way, I uh, lost it out of sight. I have no idea. Um, but thanks. Thanks for the great participation, by the way. Th thanks, Yasmin, for being here. But uh, let's go on. Okay. <laughs> it's a question that I sometimes answer. Um, What's your view on, on Christianity in general, in its current form, in its current situation? Asked by uh, Sorin Kresyon. Thanks, Sorin. Okay. Um, most of the Christians that I interact with on a daily basis are, you know, super open, friendly, uh, neighborly, kind, good people. Mm -hmm. And... I do not, it, it really, it's all about perspective, right? Like it's all about, it's all relative. So I think of, of Christianity as like, you know, when you're a nurse in the emergency, there's like triage. Mm -hmm. You're going to have somebody coming in with a bullet wound to the head, somebody coming in with like a cut finger and somebody coming in with a stomach ache or something like that. You have to decide what's the thing that we have to deal with first. And from my perspective, obviously, Islam is the most dangerous religion that we have that needs to be dealt with right now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Christianity is causing problems in countries like the Philippines and South America and, and stuff like that because it is intertwined into their lawmaking. Like it, it prevents women from getting divorces, mm -hmm. prevents them from getting abortions, things like that. But in the North American perspective, Christianity is really just like hippie love, yeah. you know, like my daughter goes to do her piano recitals in a church. So every few months we, we go to an, it's an Anglican church. There are no, there's nothing aggressive about it. Like it's not like going into a Catholic church where you have like a bloodied Jesus up on a <laughs> thing. You know what I mean? It's a very, you know, it's got a rainbow flag when you walk in the door, like it's, it's, all of these quotes all over the place about yeah. love and, and things like that. It's uh, it, it's a positive atmosphere. Nobody's yelling and screaming about the Jews and the infidels, you know, it's, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So comparatively, I don't really need to talk about Christianity or deal with Christianity in my context. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are a lot of different problems in the world and there's a lot of different people dealing with a lot of different problems. And there are a lot of really respectable, amazing people like Seth Andrews, the thinking atheist who grew up as a fundamentalist Christian or Matt Dillahunty, who also grew up like mm -hmm. he did like all sorts of crazy stuff when he was a, a Christian. 
um, like the whole healing, you know, you touch somebody and like they get saved by Jesus or whatever. I don't mm -hmm. know. Um, so those people I think are doing a really great job of speaking out against fundamentalist Christianity and the dangers of it. And so I leave, I leave them to their work and mm -hmm. I'm not really involved in speaking up against, uh, against the dangers of Christianity today. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I would I would um, agree partially. I mean, uh, people who are on my channel know already that I don't have uh, not even a small stance against Christianity because uh, I, I, if, if I just compare those two ideologies, for example, Islam and Christianity, which I don't want to. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I grew up in Germany. I lived in Turkey for 10 years. And Turkey is a very moderate Muslim country and came, and came to America. And the comparison between my life's among Islam and my life's among Christianity is just... Crazy difference. Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. Christianity is not is not causing big problems in the world. No. Christianity is not even a religion that has a that has a basis that can create as much mess as Islam does. Because Islam has this book that uh, claims to be the perfect spoken word of 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 the Almighty God for, to, uh, until the end of times, and it's full of hate, full of. Uh, orders to fight and full of repression. Christianity doesn't have such a thing. The New Testament is a, is is I <laughs> I don't know. I can never find a word for that. But it's it's so sweet in comparison. Yeah, it's like a hippie <laughs> hippie Jesus. Yeah. But um, when we were talking about finding the values to to rebuild myself, some of those values were actually Christian values. You Absolutely. know, one of them was the Golden Rule, which I'm pretty sure is Christian. So do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. I was never taught that as a Muslim. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Love thy neighbor. I was never Love taught that neighbor. as a Muslim, only if it's a Muslim neighbor, you know. <laughs> so these kinds of things um, which come from that culture of helping each other and caring about each other and loving each other, I think there's a lot of positive element. There's more positive. People like to say religion has a lot of negativity and a lot of positivity. Sure, it does, but to different degrees. So I think that you have to work really hard to find something positive in Islam, and you have to work really hard to find something negative in modern Protestant North American Christianity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would even say I would even say um, you know left leaning people and. Uh, that, that care so much about minorities and about about all the others in the world. Even they uh, took a lot of their compassion, I would say, from 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 Christian culture, from Judeo Christian culture, because because that's how people grew up. That's that's what people see. That's that's how their parents are, and that's how they think about other people. If if those same people were born somewhere in uh, I don't know Malaysia, for example, not not Malaysia. Let's not say Malaysia, but you know you know some country. I don't know yeah. Jordan. They wouldn't they wouldn't have the same attitude toward toward others yeah i find it so strange that people get so angry when they say that enlightenment values or western values um are just an evolution of judeo-christian values it's like well duh why mm -hmm. is why are we arguing this is a historical fact mm -hmm. these people grew up in that culture the people that came up with enlightenment values came from a Christian culture. Mm -hmm. And so of course it evolved from it. It, it doesn't mean that it um, stemmed from it or that it is the uh, um, the catalyst for it necessarily. Do you know what I mean? Like it doesn't mean that the raw materials for the enlightenment did not come from Christianity. We understand that, but it is an evolution of that thought. I mean, if you didn't have, if you had people saying uh, that you have to to kill everybody who's not Muslim or kill everybody who isn't one of yours, you're not, your natural evolution from that is not gonna become enlightened in values. Mm -hmm. But if you are coming from a place of like, we are all in this together and we have to love thy neighbor and da da da, then yes, that can progress into liberal values, enlightenment mm -hmm. values. Like that just, that just makes sense to me. And people like to just demonize religion entirely. And I don't think religion is, is demonic i think that it's just human thought it's just evolution we're just trying to find trying to make sense of the world and we're coming up with different ideas it's no more demonic than the greek mythology mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to clear things up even um i don't know 
some might disagree with me. I even had a had a discussion about this with Armin Navabi recently. But um, you know, people talk about about uh, the reform of Christianity and the Enlightenment movement, the scientific revolution, and so many things. The the thing is, if you look at all those movements uh, before it actually happened, they, they were led by Christians. They were led by by a lot of Christians. The Enlightenment movement was led by a lot of Christians, mm -hmm. by a lot of well known Christians. Mm -hmm. You know, the scientific revolution was led by a lot of Christians. Christians Christians reformed Christianity and so on. You know, the, the things that you that you reference and uh, that you say, well, well, this is that is why Christianity is as good as it is today. Well, that was also done by Christians. I mean, okay. if you want to give Christianity credit for all the bad things that happened, then why don't you give it give Christianity or, or Christians credit for Christian all the people? Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I agree. yeah, yeah. I mean, Christians, yeah, not, not Christianity directly. <laughs> Yeah, because I mean, even the major things like Galileo was Christian as well, right? Mm -hmm. But then he was killed by the church for saying that the earth was flat or whatever. So it's like, yeah, this, these are not, it's not like he was an atheist or he was something else. Like, you know, it, it comes from that, um, from that culture. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think it's easier for someone like you or me to see it because we are from the outside looking in. Like, we're not really truly from, islamic born and raised cultures or western born and raised cultures we have our foot one foot in each camp mm -hmm. and so that makes us able to see both camps in a way that they can't see it themselves it's like mm -hmm. a fish fish doesn't know he's wet right yeah because it's just he's surrounded by it so it's hard for for people born and raised in these societies in Christian societies to really see how vastly different it is from non-Christian societies. They have mm -hmm. to, they because they've never lived or experienced other societies other than their own. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I would like to ask, I would like to bring this question to you. Asked by uh, OK, thank you OK for the question. Uh, the question is, do you think that uh, that there is any uh, form of discrimination, of significant discrimination in the West toward Muslims? Um, I think that there is, of course there is, um, but I think it is also exaggerated. So a lot of these Islamophobia things that get trumped up, like uh, in Canada, we had a, a girl talking about an Asian man cut her hijab with scissors, and then we had our prime minister talking about it, and everybody, the whole country was denouncing this horrible act and then it turns out that she lied about it. Yeah. And that's not just one. I mean, these stories are constant everywhere all the time. Organizations like CARE like to feed this Islamophobia meme because they want to continue to have that us and them anger mentality and they want to be the victims in the situation. Um, but of course, yes, I think that there um, a lot of people are very scared of Muslims these days because every time they turn on the news, they're reading about a Muslim driving into somebody else with a truck or a nail bomb in an Ariana Grande concert or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So yes, they are nervous. They are scared. They're, they're trying to figure out why Muslims are trying to kill us left, right, and center. And therefore they end up becoming afraid of all Muslims because mm -hmm, it's just mm -hmm. a, a, like a defense reaction. So Sometimes it's it manifests as fear, and sometimes it manifests as as anger and in in violent, reactive ways. So um, so yeah, I think it's a it's a definite concern, but I think that it gets exaggerated. I mean, we are very very lucky that Western people do not react to Muslims in the same way that Muslims react to Western people. I just want to say that. Absolutely. I totally agree with that. <laughs> yeah. Like if you agree. had one, if you had Christian people going around in Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, Afghanistan and Egypt, mowing people down in trucks, I can promise you, you would have a nuclear war on your hands. Like Absolutely. they would not be letting it go. They wouldn't be like, oh, but we have to worry about Christianophobia. No, it would be a very no different reaction. No one would even <laughs> No yeah. one would give a shit. Yeah. About the feelings of Christians and this and that, no one would. No, that. I mean, what happened? Somebody, some woman in Canada was our foreign minister. Somebody tweeted about human rights concerns in Saudi Arabia, sending a tweet saying, mm -hmm. 
uh, we should let these women go that are just human rights activists. And what did they do? They kicked the American, or sorry, the Canadian ambassador out of Saudi Arabia. They kicked all of the Saudi Arabian students out of Canada. They canceled all flights, blah, 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 blah. All of this big, huge reaction because of a tweet yeah. criticizing Saudi Arabia. So don't imagine don't interfere with our affairs. Yeah, don't interfere with our affairs. So just imagine if instead that per it was somebody who had driven a truck into a group of of Saudi Arabians. Just imagine what the reaction would have been. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and the media. I mean, um, for those who don't know, I mean, uh, I I lived in one of the softest uh, countries of the of the Islamic world. But in the Islamic world, the media doesn't work like the Western media. Like the Western media, very often just uh, withholds their opinion and just tells you about what happened in in a in a slightly different way, differing from from media outlet to media outlet. It's, it's not the same in the Islamic world. In the Islamic world, in countries like Saudi Arabia, uh, the TV TV channel that brings you the news openly tells you exactly what to think. Mm -hmm. the, the news, the news out there, they, they, they directly insult And they just countries. make up lies. Yeah. yeah. And they just randomly make up statistics yeah. and they say them as if they are truth. From, from Turkey, for example, just a random example. Um, in Turkey, whenever something happens between Turkey and, and, and Germany, for example, the media starts saying things like uh, traitorous Merkel or, uh, you know, Germans did it again, you know, stuff like mm -hmm. that. that. That's how they report. They, they don't. Yeah. Do <laughs> yeah. It's not like the Western media. <laughs> not at all. Yeah. Uh, thank you. OK, for your question again. Um, just a second. Do you think, as an ex-Muslim, <laughs> tricky question. Do I uh, ask by think for yourself? Do you think uh, does Islam have an agenda? And do current Muslims, many of them, have an agenda to uh, sort of seize uh, different countries, seize different soil, like Europe, for example, or North America, for example? Do you think there is a serious agenda going on towards uh, is, towards is, towards Islamization? In the West, um, I don't. I, I do think that it is a serious agenda for Islamist groups like the Muslim Brotherhood, OIC, the Organization of Islamic Cooperative, which is the largest intergovernment group outside of the United Nations. So it's over sixty Muslim majority countries are part of this group, and they uh, vote as a as a as a block. So they're able to make. Um, they were able to, to, to cause lots of decisions to be made in the favor in whatever they want to happen. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, one, one other example is like the United Nations, the human rights uh, treaty or something, the declaration of human rights that they have. So there is a whole bunch of Muslim majority countries that said, no, 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 we don't agree with this declaration of human rights. We're going to have our own. And it was called the, the Cairo or something. Yeah. And and in it, they don't have equality for LGBT or for women or for all of these ridiculous things that were written in the in the UN Human Rights Council. So yes, there are groups of Muslims that are actively trying to spread Islam and the values of Islam. Um, but of course, your average everyday Muslim who is not involved in politics is most likely you know i mean there's a chance because so with me, in my family even though none of us were involved in politics we would sit on the sidelines and hope that it would happen and we're yeah. waiting for it to happen so there's there's it goes back to sam harris when he was talking about those concentric circles that him and majid nawaz came up with and they talk more in detail about it in islam and the future of tolerance mm -hmm. but there are different there's, you know, you got different groups. It's, it's, there's 1.6 billion Muslims. So it's really hard mm -hmm. to answer any question easily when you ask about Muslims because there's there's such a varied dynamic group of people from all over the world. Um, but different groups want different things. And yes, for sure, there are a group of Muslims that are very interested in in spreading the word of Allah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I would say I would say that uh, most Muslims don't actively have this idea of uh, sort of uh, turning the West into into Islamic land and and conquering uh, Germany or Canada or or America through this and that. But um, 
in, in, in rather peaceful families that don't engage in, in, in political fights at all. Even, even among them, there is still this idea that uh, the West will become Islamic probably at some point, and we are only waiting for that. It will be glorious. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> so the, the idea is there. I mean, not many people actively do that, but the idea is there, definitely. That's, yeah, well said. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, just a second. Oh, Harris, Harris Sultan is here. Do you know, you know Harris yeah. Sultan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love Harris. Hi, Harris. He asked the question and said, I know Yasmin said she doesn't see any point in debating Muslims. Don't you think it can help us expose the, absurdi the absurdity of Islamists and Islam when debating with them? Yeah, you know what? I'm sure it does. I just don't have the patience for it. I know <laughs> so many ex-Muslims do it. Uh, you know, I'm on the ex-Muslims of North America Facebook, like we have this private page where everybody like lots of times they share the conversations they've had with Muslims and it's like, it's just mind numbingly boring. I just, it's like, it's like playing tennis with a brick wall. Like you're not, it, you're always going to get the same responses. You're always, you're never going to be challenged or engaged in, in the, it's like talking, somebody says, somebody was saying to me before, like, why don't you talk to people about the existence of God or trying to argue with them about why they shouldn't believe in God? I don't care. I'm not going to sit there and explain to them why they shouldn't believe in unicorns or Santa Claus either. You know, it's just so, just not what I'm interested in at all. I just find it really boring. Yeah, I would, I would say from my side, I mean, of course, people bring this thing up that if you debate someone and you are and you are more influential, you make better points than them. Then there might be a chance that maybe some people could uh, could, could agree with you suddenly and uh, join your side or whatever. But I, I don't think I don't think any of those those possible results is worth the time and the effort you are wasting on debating a, a wall. You know, I totally agree. I and at the end of the day, I don't care if one more person leaves. Islam. It doesn't make a difference to me. What I care about are the women or or the different types of people that are struggling and being persecuted by Islam. Those are the people that I want to help. I want to help ex-Muslims in Muslim majority countries. I want to help women, Muslim or not, in Muslim majority countries. I want to help LGBT people in Muslim majority countries. These are the I want to be able to do something actually um, productive with my time. I, I don't think that arguing with a Muslim person and getting them to to leave Islam and it have I mean I've had lots of people. I just want to say I've had lots of people. Thankfully, gratefully, it does make me happy to get that email that says, you know what? Because of listening to you on this video or whatever, or it made me finally decide that you're right, I have to leave mm -hmm. this religion. And that does make me feel great, even though that's not my number one goal in, in what I'm doing. I'm glad that it's uh, it, it's something that that does happen because of, because of my talking. Um, but it's not just because of me. Like they would have also watched a Hitchens video or maybe The Masked Arab or maybe one of your videos or whatever, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's a culmination of a bunch of different and sometimes it can take years. It took me years to leave the religion. Mm -hmm. So I don't have the kind of time and energy to spend on, on trying to convince yeah. people out of their out of their brainwashing. They'll get out when they're ready. I would say the vast majority of Muslims don't even have the potential to actually be convinced by your points in some debate or anything. I mean, um, <clears throat> if it happens, then it's probably, uh, then it's mostly people who were skeptic already and found you and listened to you and found, found your points reasonable. Totally I don't, agree. Yeah, I, 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 I'm doing this, for example, I'm doing stuff on YouTube and many people think that I want to take Muslims out of Islam. I don't care about taking Muslims out of Islam. I can't waste my time on that. I'm doing this for the, for all the people who, who can relate for ex-Muslims, Yes. people who want to learn more about Islam to see how they can uh, talk about it. My, my I mean, Converting Muslims out of Islam is totally not prior, not, not not my priority. It's not even among my lowest goals, to be honest. Yep. It does yep. make me happy, as you said, but <sighs> that's all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Totally, we're on the same page with you on that. <clears throat> that's great. 
it's totally different from our from my conversation with Armin Navabi. Who, yeah, yeah, he's. <laughs> He thinks differently on that topic. <laughs> I'm, I'm just joking. He, he has this, he has this temper that he's uh, when he says something that he doesn't really very much agree with, especially with the atheist community that I criticize from time to time. Uh, he's like, but every community does that. <laughs> he's very passionate. <laughs> um, a question that came up here very often in the live chat asked um, by. Sunil Kul, for example, thank you, Sunil. Is um, how is your relation with um, with people that you knew before, especially with the relatives and parents, after uh, you left Islam and just became open about it? Well, that's partially the reason for the for the depression and everything is that you you lose. Well, somebody who came from a family that was as conservative as mine. Uh, you lose all contact with your family. They want nothing to do with you. You're less than a disgusting, you know, and nothing. There's, you're not even, you're subhuman. So you have the choice of either living a lie, which I know a lot of ex-Muslims today, and probably a lot of you that are listening to this right now are living a lie um, because they want to keep their families or, and I did do that, I have to admit. I did do that for for a few years where I also lived, lived that double life. Mm -hmm. But eventually I got sick of it and I got sick of living a lie. And I just said, whatever. If, if the cost for me to have my freedom is to lose all my friends and family, well, so be it. I'm willing to pay the price because mm -hmm. I really truly do believe that freedom will be worth the cost. And you know what? I had no idea how right I was. I was so much more right than I thought. If I had known how good it feels to be free, I would have left so long ago. I would never have wasted all those years worrying and you know, just hemming and hawing and living a double life and living a lie. What a waste of time. I mm -hmm. mean, it's just, it's worth any, any cost. Your freedom is worth any cost. Yeah, yeah. Um, some more questions. I lost who asked it again. I'm sorry. There, there's a, there, there are lots of conversations going on here, more than questions. It's, <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> the question was something like, what is something good that you could say about Islam? That's always a challenging question. Well, actually, the best thing about Islam for me was I know when it started, Muhammad was trying to unite all of the different Arab tribes. So there was a lot of different Arab tribes. They were all warring against each other. And it was causing a lot of, you know, obviously, um, the, the people living in Arabia at the time just never knew when the next fight was going to break out. And so he wanted he sort of came with more like a Jesus message, actually, at the time, which uh, which was of unification and of love and mm -hmm. let's support each other and blah, blah, blah. And it, it started out with good intentions. But then, as they say, you know, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. The bigger he got, the more power he got, the worse he became. If he had been killed early on in Islam, then... Muslims would not be any more dangerous than Christians today. But unfortunately, he spread like wildfire and he was very successful with his raping and looting and pillaging and and uh, all of his battles and violence. So uh, that's the uh, that's the example that that people follow today, unfortunately. So mm -hmm. so that's the positive thing is it started out with 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 a good idea. Just didn't so, end up that way. So in the end, in its final form, there is nothing good that you want to find about it. <laughs> Unfortunately, in the end, in its final form, it's very hard for me to find positive aspects. Same here. I, I can't even think of, I mean, of course there is something positive about it. I mean, just because it's a horrible religion doesn't mean uh, every single detail about it is bad. There, is sure, there are surely good things about it, but you can seriously not 
not not really think about that. No, in, in, in and it's funny because even when you do find something good, it's like, ugh, but but that like how low is the bar yeah. <laughs> for, <laughs> for that to be considered good? Absolutely. You know what I mean? Like, uh -huh. there's nothing really remarkable about it at all. Like, remarkable, <laughs> nothing positive, remarkably. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, another question asked by BB Boy is, thanks for the question, BB Boy, what do you think about uh, the whole Tommy Robinson case? Do you even follow anything about yeah, it? Yeah, like about him going to prison recently. Yeah, um, came out, I think, recently on bail or something. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So about this specific case, I think, obviously, I think it's ridiculous that the British government restrict uh free speech in the way that they do so but that's not my place to talk about that because i'm not really like i'm not a british citizen and i don't really understand the ins and outs of their of the legalities of why he was imprisoned or or whatever but i am a free speech um absolutist and i do know that they do not have uh, yeah. anything like the first amendment in the uk so i will criticize that as far as Tommy Robinson is concerned, I know that he was one of the very first people to speak about the rape gangs that were going on. He spoke mm -hmm. about it like a decade ago and he was demonized for it. And I will always have respect for him for having the courage to speak out for these girls that nobody gave a shit about. And in fact, if anybody tried to speak out about these girls, they would lose their jobs or they would be ostracized by their peers, but he didn't care. And he just kept on trying to, to speak for these girls. And so that for that, he has my, my respect. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I think that unfortunately it took a very very long time for people to try to finally listen to what he was saying and for for anything to finally be done to help these girls it's an absolute travesty mm -hmm. you know it's it's absolutely disgusting and horrific and beyond the pale and um yeah i'm glad that he was one of the first people to to speak up about it yeah i would say i mean i don't i don't uh fully agree with tommy robinson's views on so many things but um the thing is uh he had sort of a rather a, a past where he was a bit more extreme with his thoughts which he renounced later and uh took a more rational approach but always a passion towards uh exposing all the all the injustice that's going on in, in the country and that no one wants to talk about because they could be offending a minority. And Tommy Robinson has always been there and has exposed things while they are happening. I mean, while he was talking about it, a huge scandal came out of, of grooming gangs and uh, suddenly everyone could talk about it, but he was being silenced. He still uh, can't. Yeah. 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 He still got, he got kicked off Twitter for quoting the Quilliam Foundation. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Something that Majid Nawaz can say on LBC radio and the Quilliam Foundation can report or publish a report and he tweets it, the exact same thing, and he gets kicked off of social yeah. media. So, yeah, obviously it's it's not there's, you know, there's something unfair going on. Yeah, and 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 Maj Nawaz even, uh, you know, tagged Twitter Supported afterwards yeah. and said, uh, "Sorry, but he's saying something factual, and nothing happened to him." You know, it, it's it's all about, it's it's all about Tommy Robinson somehow. Uh, thanks, Miles Yoshimoto, by the way, for your super chat. Thank you so much. Um, from here, just a second. There is a question that came up that other people want me to ask to you too. Asked by Val Valkyrie, any advice for a recently discovered by ex-Muslim female in telling her religious family who she really is? <laughs> what would you say about that? Uh, what country is she in? Does it specify? Because that makes a big uh, difference. I don't believe so. No, no. Well, I'd say tread very carefully. I mean, everybody knows their own family and they can make the best decision based on knowing how their family has reacted in the past to uh, gay people and knowing how intolerant they are, I guess. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's really hard for me to, to 
to respond not knowing enough about the situation. So I would just say tread very carefully and yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. I want everybody to live free and to be happy and to, to, to live their own true self, but I also don't want people to be putting themselves in danger, like of honor violence or honor killings or something. Mm -hmm. So, um, thanks for the question. Thanks for answering us. Mean another thing that, uh, there are not many questions, but Harris asked what your position is on acts like burning the Quran, which 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 Armin, which Armin, for example, did very recently. Yeah, that's another thing that I think is just not my forte. So a lot of people are like, draw Muhammad, burn the Quran. Um, I don't think that it's really benef well, it's not my thing to just be uh provocative for the sake of being provocative to just to just be like when when I burned the hijab people were like oh you're just trying to be provocative but no to that was a real symbol for me of oppression it is a symbol of oppression there are women in Iran being imprisoned today when they remove that off of their head so um I think of it as as differently, but you know, maybe other people disagree with me. But I personally, um, you know, like I know a lot of gay people will walk around with Allah's gay, like my friend Jimmy Bangish. Wow. He mm -hmm. had the uh, Allah's gay, and uh, Allah can or what is it? Muhammad can split my moon. <laughs> <laughs> What? I haven't seen that. <laughs> oh yeah, and the gay pride parade—they have like the best signs. They were so good, but I wouldn't tweet them because oh. I was like, "Oh, that's just a bit much." Yeah, now that's... I don't. I personally, it's not that I have. It's not that I. How do I explain this? It's sort of like femen, you know, or femin. Like yeah. I support them, but I'm not going to run around topless. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like if you want to go around and burn Qurans, or if you want to you know, do whatever, like that's okay, fine. You do you. That's, that's great. I, but I personally, it's not what I would do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I so don't, much. I don't really, I personally, I don't really, I don't agree with burning books in general, even if it is the Quran. So that's, that's kind of an, as an aside. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say, um, I don't know. Some people often say that you should uh, read books instead of burning them. Uh, yes. Whatever. But read uh, the Quran. <laughs> I would say, I would say, if you are in, in a position and you have read the Quran, you have read the hell out of it. I read it three times. I haven't, I haven't burned the Quran yet. But uh, I would say it's, it's more of a just, just more of a symbolic act. I mean, yeah. We are in times now where you don't really burn books and they are gone forever. That wasn't the yeah. past. Yeah. So <laughs> I would. Yeah. Anyway, I wouldn't. No, no, I, I, I do agree. Uh -huh. I do agree uh -huh. with that in general. And I've, you know, people that I love and respect, I've seen, you know, burn the Quran and I've seen sometimes on YouTube videos, people actually like defecating on the Quran and stuff like that. Yeah. And I understand that it's coming from a place of they have really been oppressed by this religion and this is their way of fighting back. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, one of my friends, I won't mention her name, but there's nothing that helps her orgasm better than saying things like, fuck you, Muhammad, fuck Allah. <laughs> <laughs> like that really helps her get there. Yeah. And I'm like, Muhammad and Allah are the last thing I want to talk about when I'm having sex. Weird, weird. But, you know, <laughs> whatever, you do you. Like just whatever, yeah. whatever floats your boat, you know? Yeah, I would want to keep those things out of my head when I'm in an act. Right? <laughs> <laughs> would have the opposite effect, I think. Yeah, but. yeah. <laughs> oh, well, she blasphemy really does it for her, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would say we are coming toward an end here. I would take some uh, final questions, if you're okay with that. Otherwise, yeah, I'm, th I'm thinking of you here. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, a question came from Francesco Sereno. Thank you, Francesco. I would summarize your question, though, and ask the question to you, Yasmin. What would you? Th what do you think of uh, equating Nazism to Islam? Would you think um, 
Would you think they are an equivalent in, in any way? Like in I, I don't think that they are equivalent and I have never equated them, but I do think that it is um, a natural intellectual exercise to compare different fascist ideologies. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. quite often we compare Christianity and Islam and there's no issue with that. We compare communism with Nazism, no issue with that. But when we cross through an ideology and a religion and comparing those two, even though they have fascism in common, all of a sudden people lose their shit. Yeah. And I think it's really stupid when people say things like, you can't compare Islam and Nazism because they're so different. It's like, who compares apples to apples, you fucking moron? You compare things because <laughs> you're looking at what are their similarities and what are their differences. So people are like, they're different. One is a religion. Like, oh, thank you, Einstein. I never would have figured that out. <laughs> of course, they're different. But also, of course, there are many similarities. And the similarities between Islam and Nazism have been documented countless times. I mean, Christopher Hitchens talked about it. Hamid Abdel Samad, who is an Egyptian atheist from Germany, who you might know, who I respect very much. Unfortunately, a lot of his videos and stuff are in Arabic. Box of Islam, he does. Sandu al Islam. No. Hamid Abdel Samad. Oh, okay. I know his name. I don't know his activity. Yeah, he's from <laughs> Germany. So he has German. Um, you should Google him after this because you'll be able to watch his videos because mm -hmm. his videos are in German and in Eng and in Arabic. He I don't doesn't have that much going on in English. Oh, okay. But <laughs> it's funny. You're a YouTuber. You don't watch YouTube videos. <laughs> kind of weird yeah. <laughs> all right um but anyway he, he you would really like him he does lots of interviews and stuff like that he's written a book um all about the fascism in islam where he specifically in his summary for the book he talks about comparing it to nazism yeah, yeah. so the there are i think that for people in the western experience they seem to think of Nazism is like beyond human. And what they need to understand is it is it is just as human as all the other ideologies. And when we talk about, um, so this was the tweet that got everybody going crazy, is when I talked about, we always talk about we can't demonize Muslims even though we speak out against Islam. And the same is true. People don't demonize like we, Mariam Namazi is a communist who is very um, a part of the ex-Muslim community. Mm -hmm. In fact, she's the one who runs the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain. So even though many people will speak out against communism, they won't necessarily demonize communist people in their lives. Mm -hmm. And th that follows through for all human beings up until it goes to neo-Nazi white supremacist type people. Mm -hmm. And having been married to a jihadi, so that's probably, in my opinion, um, they are more damaging to the planet, not just yeah. in my opinion, I mean, statistically, jihadis are more damaging to the planet than the white supremacist neo-Nazi types. Having been married to one and understanding that it is, unfortunately, it is like a virus taking over a human brain. When you put this, when this ideology can infect the minds of perfectly normal human beings. Now, I don't personally know anybody who is a Nazi, so I can't say for a fact no that idea. that it's the exact same thing, but I have I've know a lot of ex neo Nazis and I have watched videos and interviews with a lot of ex neo Nazis and from th what they've been talking about, I can see the similarities and and movies as well. Um, the similarities are uncanny. And it, it, of course they are. It's the same thing. We're all human beings. We all have the same brains. And if you want to infect our brains with an ideology and have good people do bad things, we talk about religion and we say religion can make good people do bad things. Well, ideologies in general can. It doesn't have to be a God that's involved. Mm -hmm. So in the same way that Islam can take a good human being and turn them into a jihadi nazism can take a good human being and turn them into a, a, a nazi killer yeah yeah 
I, I would agree, and I would, I mean, I would say, of course, Nazism and Islam are not exactly the same thing, but uh, no one's saying that. Uh, the thing is that you have to look at both things from a, from a different perspective. I mean, Nazism is not really, is not even an, a real ideology. It was just uh, sort of a sort of a party program that turned into what uh, happened afterwards when Hitler rose to power, and uh, and and could exercise his power even more after shutting down all the barriers in the government that stood in front of him. Uh, the thing is, Nazism is also not the worst thing that happened in human history. Hitler wasn't the worst dictator, the worst person in human history. This is not an apology for Nazism. I despise the idea. I have known Nazis myself, but the thing is there are big similarities. And uh, what, what you just said, um, you know, equating Islam to Nazism because one is a religion, one is an ideology. Uh, that should actually give us more to think. You know, Nazism is an ideology. If people follow that ideology, they actively follow the ideas of Nazism. Islam is a religion that you are born into. If you are a Muslim, you don't directly follow exactly the ideas of Islam. You follow the ideas of Islam directly if you become an active jihadi, a fundamentalist Muslim. Then you can be equated to a Nazi. And sorry, you are not very far away from a Nazi if you are a fundamentalist jihadi. You are even, I, I would even say, I don't even want, I, I don't even need to be careful about this. I would even say that, uh, that being a fundamentalist Islamic jihadi is much worse than being a Nazi. And both of them are horrible things. Well, it's kind of interesting because these days, neo-Nazis, they don't even want to kill other people. People yeah. of other races, they just say we don't want to live with them. We want to be segregated from them. But a most, jihadi will say, "No, I want to kill them." Yeah, <laughs> most Nazis so, are, are Holocaust deniers. They are not Holocaust approvers, you know. Which is, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't, um, I don't ever think that it would be smart to to compare a Muslim person to a Nazi yeah. person. But comparing the two ideologies is absolutely worth doing and thinking about and and yeah like i said it's it's just an intellectual exercise that is that mm -hmm. is very important i think okay let me get two final things uh one is asked by anshul pundir thank you anshul um what do you think about spirituality and would you would you define yourself as a completely rationalist person in your current state um, I don't think any of us, I don't think human beings are rational in general. Mm -hmm. Um, I used to, so I've always loved Sam Harris ever since I discovered him, but I used mm -hmm. to always kind of like scoff at his mindfulness and his meditative stuff. I'd be like, Oh, Sam, <laughs> Sam and his silliness, you know, like I love the guy and I respect him and everything, but he has this one thing about him, which is just so kooky and weird, but I'll let that go. Um, but it has turned out that mindfulness has actually saved my life. It's really made a huge difference mm -hmm. for me. And I'm now one of those kooky people <laughs> that talk about woo woo and spirituality. Um, but I, this is where I began. Like this is who I was before. Um, I've always been like that, but then I, when I left Islam and I was trying to f make sense of my world, so I had all of, everything was in order and then everything was just chaotic. And so now I was trying to bring order again. And when I was bringing order to my life again, I only allowed things in that were perfectly rational and reasonable. But then, you know, you reach a point where you can be comfortable with things that even if you don't fully 100% understand them, you can still appreciate them. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an, a small example of when I was going through uh, a really bad depression, then I was given pills, which are, you know, perfectly scientifically, you know, evaluated and, you know, peer reviewed or whatever, you know, these are, this is, this is coming from a very rational scientific place, but they were very I, my body had a very negative reaction to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I decided that I wanted to try and overcome this finding different means. And so then one of the things that I did was go for acupuncture. 
And one of my friends was just like beside herself. She couldn't believe it. <laughs> She's like, who are you? <laughs> going for, I, like, this is so beyond what you would expect yeah, me to do. Yeah. Like, here I am, super rational, super rational. I'm going to go for acupuncture. She's like, are you insane? I was like, I, I don't know. People have been sticking pins in themselves for thousands of years. <laughs> and it's somehow it's still happening. So maybe there's something to come out of this. I don't know. So we don't have all the answers. And I think yeah. that it's pretty arrogant um, to think that we do. Science never pretends to have all the answers. And um, I've now become much more open to irrational things that are um, like I have a, I have more of a soft spot before that I, when people were religious and I'd be like, no, it's stupid. You don't need to believe in fairy tales. It's dumb. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Whereas now when I meet somebody who's religious, I can be like, okay, I get it. I understand that you need it and that it makes you happy to talk to your imaginary friend before you go to bed. That's cool. Whatever. That's fine. Like I no longer have that. I get, I would say irrational, um, Good anger nice. at them for being so stupid. Yeah. Now it's like, whatever you do, you do whatever makes you happy. Yeah, I as long as you're not hurting anybody. And as long as you're not trying to force anybody else to talk to your imaginary friend, we're cool. Yeah. I mean, I, I found myself in that, in that, in that phase when I, uh, after I left Islam immediately where I just wanted to say, uh, fuck God. And I wanted to go out and tell all the people that they're believing in bullshit and should stop following it and whatever, but you want to save everybody. Yeah. But when I came to my senses a bit more, when I got over that, uh, leaving Islam phase, I was just like, you know, most people don't cause any problem. Why should I yes. go out and, and, and fight this? You know, what, why would I do that? I don't even have a have a, have a problem with people believing in Islam around me, which is uh, the most horrible thing that I've ever known in my life. So why would I go around and tell people that they should stop believing in religion, which makes them happy, which some people even need, you know? Yep, totally, totally agree. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, last thing I want to ask you is if you are a medical doctor. What? <laughs> No, I'm a university yeah, professor. I know. I know. You don't have to answer the question. I saw it since the beginning in the live chat. You have to know about this. This is an inside joke on my channel. Oh, <laughs> oh okay. Just, I made this video back about uh, a few months ago about, about Zakir Naik. And, uh -huh. uh, and there's this part in that video where he says repeatedly, I'm a medical doctor. Oh, and yes, I, yes. <laughs> and I painted it over and over again. So it comes over and over again. It became an uh, inside joke. Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Whenever I talk to someone, people want me to ask about the medical doctor. <laughs> <laughs> you have to ask it with the accent, too. I, but I also ask a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> but let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> we need video here for this. Yeah, yeah. I will have him some time here, too. I want to make something with him, actually. We, we could all do something together. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I think you are very tired from uh, talking to me, from hearing all my questions. Oh, I could talk to you forever. This was awesome. Thank you so much yeah. for having me on. That's just the outside voice. I know you have an inside voice. <laughs> <No. laughs> <laughs> I'm not a Muslim anymore. Now my voice is my voice. What you see is what you get. That's what gets me in trouble, actually, me is because I was suppressed for so many years. Now I refuse to suppress myself. Thoughts come out before I even have a chance to vet them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. I, I, I became uncontrollably open about stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, thank you guys so much for your participation. Thank you for all the questions, all the comments, all the conversations that you had among yourselves that I couldn't even follow and looked at some times and just laughed here for no reason. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much, Yasmin, for, for, for coming and talking to me, answering all these questions. Uh, I believe pleasure. most most of viewers think that you are a very brave uh, person, a very brave individual, that you dedicate yourself to this and all the things that you went through. I agree totally with them. Um, yeah, thank you so thank much. Thank you, thank you so much for having me on. Before I go, I just want to tell everybody to think outside the box. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. This is my organization here, Free Hearts, Free Minds. So if you could um, go to freeheartsfreeminds.com and if you have it in your heart and soul to give a little bit of zakah, 
That's so, <laughs> to join to join the Patreon and to support us monthly, if you could. What our organization does is it helps um, ex-Muslims in Muslim majority countries through offering six weeks with a dedicated life coach. And in some, in most cases, it's the only opportunity that these people have to share their thoughts and their inner feelings with anybody. Because obviously to speak out against Islam or to admit that you're an ex-Muslim in these countries is, you know, it, it could cost you your life. Totally. Totally agreed. So if, if you want to support, uh, you have the references. I will also post everything uh, in, the, in, the, in the description after this video. You also have your online activity, Confessions of an Ex-Muslim, right? And as far as I remember, you were writing a, a memoir or something? That's correct. The memoir is still to be published. So that will be, that's to be announced. Yeah. Soon. It, it, Just it, follow me on Twitter or subscribe to my website and you'll definitely be getting a notification i will put all those links below in the description for you Don't thank worry. you very much <laughs> all right thank you so much guys thanks for participating again and again i'll just go on and think a second time i won't do that <laughs> uh do you have anything else to say no that's all thanks so much for having me and thank you everybody who joined us and have a great day and stay away from islam that's my final line i have to do that stay away, <laughs> stay from, away from drugs no to drugs no to islam <laughs> <laughs> bye bye <clears throat>